Thank you very much. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, my name is Miroslav Radenkovic, and today I'm going to talk about the dual GIP, GLP-1 receptor stimulation in treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus, the groundbreaking twin creatine approach. Here, I declare no conflict of interest regarding this presentation. And at the beginning, let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this meeting for kindly inviting me to present this lecture in the capacity of keynote speaker. So, thank you once more. Okay, so the prevalence of diabetes and obesity is an increasing worldwide problem and is referred to as the twin epidemics. In the pathophysiological context today, we know that native glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GIP, and glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1, are increasing hormones that stimulate insulin secretion and decrease glucagon secretion. So GIP also has a role in nutrient and energy metabolism, while GLP-1, in addition, delays gastric emptying, suppresses appetite, and improves state of being sated. So accordingly, glucagon-like peptide 1 in pharmacotherapy is a confirmed treatment alternative for the management of type 2 diabetes mellitus and is suggested early in the treatment protocol due to glycemic efficacy, weight reduction, and beneficial cardiovascular outcomes. So glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, in contrast, was thought to have no potential as a glucose-lowering therapeutic approach. However, co-infusion of GLP-1 and GIP was shown to exhibit a synergistic effect resulting in notably increased insulin response with preventing further buildup of glucagon. These clarifications led to development of a dual GIP, GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, tirzepatid, functionally recognized as twin creatine. So tirzepatid is a recently registered and the first in class novel dual GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist with potent glucose lowering and weight loss actions. So it improves glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes as an adjunct to diet and exercise with an acceptable safety profile. Given the previous facts, the main objectives of this presentation will be to clarify pharmacological properties of tirzepatid, including pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, indications and contraindications for use, then adverse drug reactions, as well as the most important drug interactions. Hopefully, this will provide a better understanding of this groundbreaking drug for type 2 diabetes mellitus and most likely obesity management, not so far, thus helping clinicians in appropriate prescribing and its adequate clinical use. So, moving further, the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes is a complex process and yet to be fully understood. A combination of insulin resistance in the early phase of the disease process and relative insulin deficiency results in hyperglycemia. Chronic hyperglycemia leads to glucose toxicity, which in turn causes pancreatic beta cell dysfunction and exacerbates insulin deficiency in the late phase. The ultimate result of this is a vicious circle of hyperglycemia leading to a worsening of a metabolic state. One of the main modifiable risk factors for diabetes is obesity. The parallel rise in the prevalence of obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus is a global health challenge, and obesity is strongly associated with insulin resistance, one of the key features of pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, and one of the barriers for achieving good glycemic control. So management of type 2 diabetes, therefore, includes dietary intervention 
and lifestyle modification to promote weight loss along with pharmacotherapy to combat hyperglycemia and optimize metabolic parameters such as a blood pressure and lipids and metabolic surgery in some cases. The ideal glucose lowering medication should be efficacious, not associated with weight gain but promoting weight loss, have low risk of hypoglycemia and proven cardiovascular benefits. So, the last 15 years or so have seen new classes of diabetes medications available for management of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Let's talk about incretin hormones. The term incretin, first described in 1932, refers to hormones released from the gut that regulate the insulin response to a meal. In 1964, a significant and sustained rise in plasma insulin response following an oral glucose load was demonstrated compared to apparent glucose load. This phenomenon was later known as the incretin effect, and this accounts for up to 65% of postprandial insulin secretions. So there are two principal incretin hormones responsible for the incretin effect. So the first one is glucagon-like peptide, GLP-1, and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, GAP, formerly known as gastric inhibitory polypeptide. GLP-1 is a 30 amino acid peptide synthesized in the L cells of the intestine. Once released into the circulation, GLP-1 binds to a specific GLP-1 receptor, which is expressed in the pancreas, gastrointestinal tract, kidney, heart and brain. Endogenous GLP-1 has a short half-life of 1 to 2 minutes, in addition to the well-known insulinotropic property in response to nutrients in the gut, GLP-1 has a glucagonostatic effect, inhibiting glucagon secretion in the hyperglycemic and normoglycemic state, but not during hypoglycemia. Extrapancreatic properties of GLP-1 include slowing of gastric emptying, promoting satiety, and reducing food intake. As for the GAP, GAP is four amino acid peptide produced by the K cells of the intestine, mainly located in the duodenum and proximal yeunum. So GAP is released in response to oral nutrients, especially carbohydrates and lipids. GAP, like GLP-1, has a short half-life of only four to seven minutes. GAP receptors are present in various tissues such as pancreas, adipose tissues, gastric mucosa, heart, adrenal cortex, bone and brain. Endogenous GAP also stimulates glucose-dependent insulin secretion and is responsible for a greater proportion of the incretin effect than GLP-1. One difference between GAP and GLP-1 is the effect on glucagon secretion. So, unlike GLP-1, GAP has dual function, a glucagonotropic property in the normal glycemic and hypoglycemic state and glucagonostatic in the hyperglycemic state. So, the incretin effect is significantly reduced in patients with type 2 diabetes compared to people without diabetes. The proposed mechanism, because the, the, uh, the, the timed loss of incretin effect include, first of all, a reduction in incretin hormone response to nutrients, so we are calling that hyposecretion, and the second, a reduction in insulinotropic effect of pancreas beta cells. However, as for the dual GAP and GLP-1 action, we can say that co-administration of GAP and GLP-1 receptor agonist in healthy individuals has additive effect, generating a significantly increased insulin response comparing with separate administration of each hormone. Furthermore, the combined infusion produced 
a significant glucagonostatic effect while separate administration of GIP or GLP-1 did not suppress glucagon secretion more than glucagon alone. The long-term effect of GAP and GLP-1 receptor agonism was first described when a unimolecular dual agonist GAP and GLP-1 receptors was developed, referred to as a twin cretin. The twin cretin was shown to have high affinity to GLP-1 and GIP receptors with negligible glucagon receptor activity. In early animal studies, GAP and GLP-1 receptor coagonist therapy at one to three weeks produced a dose-dependent reduction in blood glucose, body weight, food intake, and fat mass. The coagonist was modified by attaching a polyethylene glycol or a 16-carbon acyl chain to extend it half-life, allowing weekly dosing. So the pegylated coagonist was first investigated in 44 people with type 2 diabetes. After six weeks, a dose-dependent decrease of hemoglobin A1c compared to placebo was observed, and the coagonist was well tolerated with mild to moderate gastrointestinal side effects and no hypoglycemic events. So we are reaching out, uh, reaching now to tirzepatid. So tirzepatid was developed by Eli Lilly and is a dual GAP1, GLP1 receptor agonist formulated as a synthetic linear peptide containing 39 amino acids based on the native GAP sequence. It is attached to a 20 carbon fatty acid moiety which binds to albumin prolonging its half-life to five days and thus once more enabling once weekly dosing. The clinical efficacy, safety, and tolerability of tirzepatid has been reported in phase one and phase two clinical trials. As for the safety and tolerability, since tirzepatid is a dual GAP GLP-1 agonist, the side effect profile was comparable to that of GLP-1 receptor agonist. And the most frequently observed side effects were related to the gastrointestinal system and nausea, diarrhea and vomiting were the most common adverse events. That leads us to very special investigation of tirzepatid uh, uh, induced and uh, uh, published in surface clinical trials. So the surface clinical trial program aimed to assess the efficacy and safety of tirzepatid as a treatment to improve glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes mellitus. The surface phase 3 clinical trials include six global, two Japanese and one Asia Pacific studies. These trials include anti-hyperglycemic therapy naive patients, those patients who were treated with only diet and lifestyle, as well as patients on various oral antihyperglycemic agents, for example, metformin, sulfonylurea, pioglitazone, and so on. Some studies were placebo controlled, and others have active comparators such as GLP 1 receptor agonist, adulaglutid, and semaglutid, long acting insulin analogs like glarging and degludec or short-acting insulin analog Lispro. The surface truck trials are designed to assess once weekly tirzepatid doses of 5 mg, 10 mg, and 15 mg, and the primary endpoint for each of these studies, except surface j Kamba, is change in hemoglobin A1c from the baseline. The primary endpoint of the surface combo, the J combo, is the number of participants with more than one severe adverse effect. Surface 1 was 40 week, double blind, randomized phase 3 trial. Participants were subject with type 2 diabetes, inadequately controlled by diet and exercise alone, and assigned to receive 
once a week feels hepatic, 5, 10 or 15 milligrams are a placebo. At 40 weeks, feels hepatic induce a dose-dependent decrease in hemoglobin A1C and body weight. Gastrointestinal events were the most frequent adverse effects, such nausea, diarrhea and vomiting and severe hyperglycemia was not reported. Surface 2 was an open-label 40-week phase 3 clinical trial. Over 1,800 patients enrolled and received fusepatid at a dose of 5, 10 or 15 mg or semaglutid at a dose of 1 mg. Fusepatid at all doses was non-inferior and superior to semaglutid and, uh, and as regards to the mean change in the hemoglobin uh, 1c, whereas the reduction in body weight was greater with fusepatid than with semaglutid. The most common adverse events were gastrointestinal as previously reported. In another phase 3 study, there were over 1,900 subjects enrolled with type 2 diabetes. Researchers have evaluated the efficacy and safety of fusepatid versus titrated insulin, insulin degluded in subjects with type 2 diabetes inadequately controlled by metformin with or without uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. The surface 3 findings show that people with type 2 diabetes can obtain a better glycemic control with fusepatid than with insulin deglutic, while losing weight rather than gaining weight. A higher incidence of gastrointestinal adverse effect was reported in participants treated with fusepatid compared with those treated with deglutic. SERPIS 4 I'm sorry, was an open-label global trial comparing the safety and efficacy of fusepatid with titrated insulin glargine in over 2,000 people with type 2 diabetes with an increased cardiovascular risk, uh, who were treated with metformin, a sulfonylurea, or SGLT2 inhibitor. And more than 85% of participants had a history of cardiovascular diseases. The highest dose of fusepatid led to a significant hemoglobin A1C reduction at 52 weeks. Surface 5 was designed for comparing fusepatid versus the placebo as an add-on therapy to titrate insulin glargine. It was a randomized phase 3 double-blind trial with over 450 participants enrolled. Fusepatid was associated with greater hemoglobin A1C reductions and body weight reductions than placebo therapy. However, Fusepatid was not registered at this point for losing weight. So let's see what are the results in this compartment. So the rapidly increasing prevalence of obesity and obesity-associated morbidity is causing an ever-increasing global burden. And beyond lifestyle modifications, pharmacological approaches to losing body weight to achieve a decrease in cardiometabolic complications are in the spotlight. So pre-existing anti-obesity medications approved for long-term prescription use showed a weight reduction of only around 5% more than placebo. In contrast to the modest efficacy of pre-existing anti-obesity medications, a newly developed fusepatid as a weekly administered injectable drug exhibited outstanding weight loss effects in a series of multinational randomized phase three trials. And indeed, the semaglutid treatment effect in people with obesity 2 study and surface one and surface two studies provided really valuable results. So we need to just say that semaglutid is an analog with 94 homology to human glucagon-like peptide one. With a minimal effect on energy expenditure and gastric gapping, the primary mechanism of weight loss by semaglutid is thought to be reduced energy consum uh, consumption via interference with food preference, inhibition of appetite, and 
intensification of safety. So let's see what are the comparisons. So in step two, 68 week treatment with semaglutide at dose of 2.5 milligrams reduced the absolute body weight by 9.7 kilos, which corresponded to a 9.6 decrease percent decrease from the baseline. Surface one revealed that pirzepatid 50 milligrams at week 40 displayed 9.5 kilos of absolute weight loss with a 10.1% greater decrease than placebo. So injection of pirzebatic at 50 milligrams for the same duration lowered the body weight by 13.1% in surface two studies. So as of 2029, five anti-obesity medications shown on this slide have been authorized for long-term administration in the US. With the exception of the, of the recently authorized semaglutid, these actively prescribed anti-obesity medications generally result only in three to seven percent greater weight loss than placebo. The weight losing effect of semaglutid and pirzepatid uh, were highly significant in light of this. More, moderate weight loss of 5 to 10 percent ameliorates cardiovascular risk factors such as hyperglycemia, hypertension, or dyslipidemia. And 70 to 80 percent of patients treated with semaglutid and pirzepatid at 15 milligrams reach this goal. And these highly effective medications enable a considerable proportion of their user to achieve sufficient weight loss to alleviate obesity-associated metabolic diseases. As for tirzepatid, further investigation into its effect on body composition, cardiometabolic comorbidities, as well as its cost-effectiveness will allow for further personalized utilization. Until now, we are going back to the Pirzebatic pharmacological properties that are registered and officially indicated by the uh, US FDA. So, Pirzebatic was developed by Eli Lilly. And uh, in May 20, uh, 2022 was the registration. This started the so called twin threatening era of enormously important and appealing dual therapeutic options for diabetes and obesity, as well as an advanced management of closely related cardiometabolic settings. As for the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacological actions, we can say the further. So tirzepatid is GAP receptor and GLP-1 receptor agonist. Tirzepatid enhanced uh, first and second phase insulin secretion and reduce glucagon levels both in glucose dependent manner. Tirzepatid increases insulin sensitivity. Tirzepatid delays gastrolyptin. The delay is largest after the first dose and this effect diminishes over time. Tirzepatid slows post meal glucose absorption, reducing postprandial glucose. Tirzepatid decreases food intake and reduces body weight in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. As for pharmacokinetics, we can say this. So the pharmacokinetics of tirzepatid is similar between healthy subjects and patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Steady state plasma tirzepatid concentration were achieved following four weeks of once weekly administration. Tirzepatid exposure increases in a dose proportional manner. So in that way, the primary excretion units of tirzepatid metabolites are via urine and feces, and intact tirzepatid is not observed in urine or feces. The intrinsic factor of age, gender, race, ethnicity, and body weight do not have clinically relevant effect on the pharmacokinetics of Tirzepatid, which is really good pharmacological profile. As for the indications and use, 
This hepatitis is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor and the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist officially indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So it is not still registered for losing body weight. However, there are some limitations of use. Of use, for example, this hepatitis has not been studied in patients with history of pancreatitis. And this hepatitis is not indicated for use in patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus. This hepatitis should be administered subcutaneously, once weekly at any time of the day, with or without meals. And the recommended starting dosage is 2.5 mg, while the maximum dosage is 15 mg subcutaneously once a week, as previously uh, observed in the clinical studies. As for the contraindications, personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or in patients with multiple endocrine neoplasma syndrome type 2 should be followed, and no serious hypersensitivity to this hepatitis or any of the excipients included. This is also very important contraindication. But we have only two contraindications, but for the adverse reactions, we have a little bit uh, more to say. Because the most common adverse reactions reported in more than 5% of patients treated with this hepatitis were nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting, constipation, dyspepsia, and abdominal pain. But there were warnings and precautions connected to these adverse drug reactions. First of all, pancreatitis has been reported in clinical trials, which means that we should discontinue promptly the drug if pancreatitis is suspected. Then the hypoglycemia with concomitant use of insulin, secretagogotropin or insulin, uh, can uh, produce increase of hypoglycemia, including severe hypoglycemia, and then reducing dose of insulin sec or secretagog uh, or insulin may be necessary. As for the hypersensitivity reaction, since those were reporting, discontinue the drug if, sus if suspected. If we are talking about acute kidney injury, we need to monitor renal function in patients with renal impairment reporting severe adverse gastrointestinal reactions. If we are talking about severe gastrointestinal disease, the use of drug may be associated with gastrointestinal adverse reactions, sometimes severe ones. If we are talking about diabetic retinopathy, the drug has not been studied in patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy required acute therapy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy or diabetic macular edema. So monitoring of these patients with a history of diabetic retinopathy uh, would be required. Acute bladder disease has occurred in clinical trials, so if cholelithiasis is suspected, Gallbladder studies and clinical follow-up are indicated. We don't have so much of a drug interaction, so in vitro studies have shown low potential for hepatitis to inhibit or reduce cytochrome enzymes in liver and to inhibit the drug transporters. So hepatitis delays gastric emptying and has the potential to impact the absorption of concomitantly administered oral uh, preparations. So therefore, we need to monitor patients on oral medications dependent of threshold concentration for efficacy and those with a narrow therapeutic index, for example, warfarin with concomitantly administered with tirzepatid. What about speci uh, specific populations? Well, as for the pregnancy, Based on animal studies, the drug may cause fetal harm. In pregnant rats or uh, rabbits administered with fusepatid during organogenesis, fetal growth reductions and fetal abnormalities did occur. These adverse embryo fetal effects in animals coincided with pharmacological effects 
on maternal weight and food consumption as well. So therefore, these hepatites should be used during pregnancy only, but only if the potential benefit justifies the potential risk to the fetus. As for the females of reproductive potentials, the use of this hepatite may reduce the efficacy of oral hormonal contraceptives due to the delayed gastrodemptine. And this delay is largest after the first dose and diminishes over time. And females should be advised to use oral contraceptives to switch to a non-oral contraceptive method or add a barrier method of contraception for four weeks after initiation and for four weeks after each dose escalation. If you are talking about renal impairment, no dose adjustment of drug is recommended for patients with renal impairment. However, we need to monitor renal function when initiating or escalating doses of this hepatite in patients with renal impairment reporting severe uh, adverse gastrointestinal reactions. And finally, we can say something about the hepatic impairment. So no dosage adjustment of the drug is recommended for patients with hepatic impairment and in clinical pharmacology studies in subjects with varying degrees of hepatic impairment, no change in this hepatic pharmacokinetics was observed. In the case of overdosage, we don't have a specific antidote. So appropriate supportive treatment should be indicated according to the patient's clinical signs and symptoms. A period of observation and treatment for these symptoms may be necessary, taking into account the half-life of this hepatic of approximately five days. Finally, we can say, Diabetes type 2 and obesity are deep-rooted diseases that have no specific cure so far, but can be kept under control by proper application of therapy and treatment, as well as incorporating lifestyle modifications. The alarming increase in the number of patients worldwide requires new scientific developments in order to ease administration, reduce the frequency of dosing and address multiple issues with a single medication, if possible. So Tirzipatid has shown promising results in terms of reducing hemoglobin A1c and reducing body weight in phase one and phase two clinical trials. The SERPACE one to five clinical trials have given favorable results by comparison with similar moieties such as semaglutid or dolaglutid. So the US FDA has approved this hepatic, uh, which has become a revolutionary agent for the management and treatment of diabetes type 2 and achieving weight goals. Patient compliance and dose adherence are also favored since it has the advantage of a once a week dose administration. Thus, this hepatic could be a breakthrough in the treatment of diabetes type 2. As such, further research in synthetic peptide therapeutics will gain increasing force from now on. So I hope this lecture provided some new insights regarding the cover scientific and related medical challenges. And thank you very much for your kind attention.